We are going to share for the next three weeks, this week included, a little mini-series on who goes to heaven. Kyle and I had the opportunity on Wednesday to walk in the neighborhood, and we went door to door. And if you're here today and you, you receive one of those heaven who goes there flyers in your door and you decide to show up to see what the series is about, we're, we're especially welcoming you. But I also want to throw on the screen, uh, yeah, we're excited to connect with some people online today for the very first time who are watching the service who would have been sitting with Sonia and I, but our neighbors, Riva and Batista, we welcome you. Riva got injured and she's not feeling that great and so she couldn't be here today, but they said they'd be watching online. Would you give a hand for my friends, Riva and Batista? If they were in person, they'd be so embarrassed. You guys are at home. Love you all, and our neighbors are wonderful. So thank you for being here today. I'd like you to take your Bibles. We're going to look at Scripture. I'm going to, going to just jump around on a few texts. But for the most part, I want to speak to you from my heart. Um, I want to share with you the message. Obviously, the theme is heaven. Who goes there? That's what we're talking about today. So that's the title on the screen. Um, heaven, who goes there? And today with the emphasis on heaven who goes there, how good is good enough? All right, how good is good enough? And I want us to zero in on that whole idea. Do good people go to heaven? I want to tell you a little story of a Sunday school uh, teacher who had a class of early pre-grade grade schoolers, and she decided she wanted to explain uh, what it takes to go to heaven. And before she started her class, she thought she'd do a little survey and, and ask them a series of questions to see if they had any understanding of heaven at all before she began her lessons. And so she asked the first question. She said, okay, kids, if I sold my house and I had a garage sale and took all the money and gave it to the poor, would I be able to go to heaven? And all the kids in the class said, no. And then she goes, okay, what if I went to church, obeyed my parents, cleaned and tidied my room all the time, would I go to heaven? And the kids go, oh, no, no. And then she asked the third question. She said, okay, what if I was really kind to animals and I gave all the children I knew lots of candy and the kids paused and hesitated, but then said no. And then she goes, what is the reason why somebody goes to heaven? And one kid from the back yells in the class and says, you gotta be dead. <laughs> so... So today in part one of this three-part series, Who Goes to Heaven Other Than Dead People, we're going to find out who actually gets to go there. Anyway, you know, uh, because you're part of the statistic of this, you probably, majority of people believe that there is a heaven, there's an afterlife some sorts, and a lot of people believe that. And a lot of people, when you go to a funeral, it seems like everybody leaves, oh, that person went to heaven. And that it's a good place. The afterlife is nice. It's, everyone wants to go there. Country songs are written. Everybody wants to go to heaven, but nobody wants to die. We hear it everywhere. But there's a lot of mystery and there's a lot of questions that still linger in the minds of people. They're really not 100% sure if they're going to go to heaven or not. And so there's a lot of conversations, a lot of questions, but the majority of people believe it to be true. Most people have a sense that there has to be an afterlife. What's beyond this life? What's beyond the grave? And if it's a good place, then probably good people are supposed to go there. Most of us are confident in here. And if I'm going to ask that question, if you think you're going to heaven, don't raise your hands right now. But for some of us, we don't really think about heaven that often, except for if you do go to a funeral or if the pastor happens to do a series on heaven. Because most of us, we got to go to work. we got to raise our kids. Uh, we got to go to this meeting. We're so busy with life that we don't really think about those afterlife because our life right now is so full, we don't have time to really consider these ideas if there is a heaven. So there's two assumptions that fuel this idea that good people to go to heaven is number one is people really believe good people, good people go to heaven. And the second assumption is this, I'm a good person. We all think that. And so let me just kind of unpack that and go beyond the surface of that idea, and let's dig into, do good people really go to heaven? Uh, I'm a good person, so I think I'm, I'm supposed to go. Now, there are some Christians who actually reject this formula, and there are some Christians who sort of believe that, yeah, you got to be good, 
There's got to be good works to reject part of it. And other Christians accept a completely different idea of this. And so since we're in church, why don't we talk about what we really believe about heaven? How many people think that's a good idea? I want to read a scripture to you. We're going to talk about it, all right? Behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven. So God owns heaven. He, 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 heaven belongs to God. And the heaven of heavens and the earth with all that is in it. So there's more than just one idea of heaven. Is there more levels of heaven? Is there a third heaven? Where, what's the heaven of heavens where God abides and lives forever and ever? And is that where we go? How do we get there? Like when we die, do we immediately go? Like all these ideas of the God of heaven. There are several advantages to believing in the kind of thinking that good people go to heaven. So I'm going to talk about those advantages. First advantage is this. It's just. It's fair. This is the way it should be. Good people end up in heaven. You know, that's the idea that good people are rewarded for being good in this life. Everybody, for the most part, knows what good is, or they think they know what good is and know what bad is. We, we discern between that there's good and there's evil in this world. The bad guys, you know, the good guys get the bad guys. We see movies about good people, bad people all the time. But do we truly know what it takes to be good enough? We all have different variations of this understanding, and this is where I want to go beyond the surface of this idea. So, not everybody can be wrong. Maybe everybody can be wrong. Let's go to the second advantage of thinking that good people go to heaven is because you're, good, you're a good person, you make the cut. Go ahead and give somebody a high five beside you right now. You're a good enough person, you're going to make the cut. There we go. Only you're not so sure you want to high five because you know that might be a trick question. All right. It's an advantage. Good people go. In fact, some people, and some people in this place, I got to tell you, you are, you are better than good. You're like, there's an amazing, there, how many ever met somebody that's amazing? Like, wow, they're, they're an awesome person. They're so kind, they're so good, they're so loving. And you put them up there like, that's a good person. You ever judge people and think, wow, they're really good. Every, anybody ever done something really nice for you? And you go, oh, that's a nice person. That's a good person. You ever had that before? You ever go through drive through and somebody before you paid your Timmy's? and you don't even know who they are, and they go, that's a good person. And then you show up and you don't have a bill. That's an awesome feeling. There's all kinds of ways we judge what is good and why they make the cut. So there's amazing people, but because we don't want to be judgmental, we're kind of afraid to judge people if they're good or bad or not. We don't want to be judgmental, but you know in your quiet moments, in your imaginary conversations with yourself, you know that you're better than... You know, you're, you're a little better than, and, you know, definitely better, I'm not pointing at anybody, better than, you know, you, you have these ideas that you think you're better than. At least I'm not, I might not be amazing, but at least I'm better than, and we have these judgments. How many want to really be honest, and sometimes you've done that? Come on, let's be honest. I got two hands up. Three people, the new person, thank you. Anybody else? I think the rest of the church knows me enough they're afraid that I'm going to trick them. No trick question. How many people have you ever judged somebody before thinking you're better than them? Yeah, let's... Uh, balcony? Nobody? All right. I need to do this series. This is for sure. All right. We don't say it out loud, but we think it sometimes. Here's the third advantage of the good people go to heaven is that it supports the notion of a good God. We've got a good God. So why wouldn't good people go to a good heaven? We think that way. It's interesting. There virtually is no theology in any of Christendom that says that God is bad. We don't believe that God is bad. In the beginning, a really bad God created the heavens and earth. No, we don't think that way. God does all kinds of things. We don't think he's bad, but we live our lives with a judgment that sometimes God's bad, that he's not always good. And we have this kind of weird kind of conflict, tension, because we hear people say, well, that was an act of God, and it was a disaster, or a tornado, or a flood, or an earthquake, and it was an act of God, because the insurance company don't want to pay. That's why they say that. But the reality is we believe that these really bad things must come from a God that's not always good. So we have this assumption. 
But we do pray, and it kind of does make sense that the afterlife must be good, because we say, Our Father, good Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be their name. We praise your name because you're so awesome, you're so mighty, you're so amazing. So we think the God we follow is a good God. Let me add my personal opinion based on what I believe and what I know in the Bible. He is good. He is good. He's always good. God is good. All the time. And all the time. Yeah. So if he's always good, then maybe always good people go to heaven. Oh, we'll just hold it right there. So here's another advantage, kind of a back door to this idea, is the fourth thing is the fear of not going to heaven should motivate people to be good. Because we don't want to go the other place. We don't go somewhere else. We want to go to heaven. In fact, the fear of the afterlife, that there's some cosmic being watching over us, that he's going to get us if we don't live right and do right. I was raised with that kind of religion that God's going to get me. And I better not screw up. The other thing is there's people that live with the fear of the rapture is going to happen any second. And you're always being good because you don't want to miss the do 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 and be out of here. For those who don't know what that is, it's the end time concept that the raptures can come and all the good people, all the Christians go to heaven and all hell breaks loose on the earth. Now, this is not a series on the rapture, so we'll move right along. The idea of the afterlife that God's kind of keeping score, it's a little intimidating, a little motivating maybe. The fact that there is a sense that we have a conscience, which a lot of people believe we have a conscience. There's some kind of conscience that hovers over all of humanity, that there is good and evil in situations where we believe we find ourselves, that maybe there is something divine. We're not making this up. we got a conscience. We know that was wrong. So we kind of think we know how to decide between the good and the bad of life because behind everything, and that's a good pressure to have. I'm not going to say otherwise. I don't think that's the way God initially wants him to be known by us because I was raised with religion that made me feel guilty every stinking Sunday I went to church. I felt so bad. I was worse than the worm, apparently crawling in the dust. I felt on the front row, and all of us teenage boys, oh, this is a bunny trail, but I got to tell you, all of us teenage cousins, there were like 10 of us there. We'd go to the same church service every week, all the family there, and we'd be like, I won't tell you all the things we did, but we'd be like, you know, kind of like, and then we get the eye from the pulpit. And it felt like the eye of God. And we were going to hell if we didn't stop making jokes and laughing in church. How many people, turn to the person beside you and smile, make them relax right now. Just go ahead and smile, make them feel good. All right. So this idea that we'll be rewarded if we're good, you know, we do what we ought to do, especially when it costs me something, when I have to sacrifice. I'm sure God's looking at that. And when I didn't want to do something and end up doing something, that's a pretty good thing. And God's keeping score. There's a payoff for being extra nice and extra kind and extra self-control, isn't there? So you conclude, be good, and you'll go to a good place. But is that true? And this concept just sort of hangs out over us again, and everybody can't be wrong about it. And it seems to be some sort of universal assumption that this is the way it is. But on closer examination, and again, when you begin to scratch beneath the comforting surface of the, surface of the idea that there's a heaven waiting for us, that good people go to heaven when they die, um, that idea, that theory is just that. It's a theory. It's not an idea that's backed up by scripture. The Bible doesn't have a list. You do, you do, you do, you do. You get to go, 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 go to heaven. That's not the way it is. It actually becomes a little absurd when you realize that how do we determine what's good enough? So with that said, I want to talk about some unsettling realities. You thought that was unsettling. Let's talk about a few unsettling realities. I'm going to call them myths, so to speak. So the first unsettling reality we'll, we'll recognize is myth number one. The human race, the, all of humanity has no indisputable, agreed upon, defined, divine standard. Humanity has no indisputable, agreed upon, divine standard of what is good. Throughout all of societies, all of generations, this idea is kind of fluid. It kind of like 
changes, even with the cultures that we live in. If there's a God that's going to let us get into heaven because we're good, then God should have let us know what good is. Anybody have a Bible verse that comes to the top of the mind that gives you a definition of what is good? Can't find it. I couldn't find it. I can't give it to you because it's not there. You know, this is good. This is bad. Yeah, there's some ideas of that in scripture. This is wrong. We, we see that to be true. This is evil. We, we know that there are some ideas, but do any of those indicate that if we stay away from the wrong, the evil, the bad, and we only embrace the good, that that, is, that qualifies us alone for heaven. So because there's no multi-generational agreed upon idea, you ask a younger generation what's good compared to an older generation what's good, and you're going to have two different conversations. Would you, would you agree with that? You living today in 2023 would have a totally different conversation if you talk to your great, great, great grandfather or grandmother about what is good. Because back then, the standards were different than today about all kinds of things. And so in part, this is what we forget is that people in different, um, different places on the planet, different generations, different cultures don't have the same, there's no multi-generational universal set of rules to measure our behavior against. Let me give an illustration, and this will help. All of you know enough history to know that this is true, and I mean, it isn't just the idea or the concept of truth, but justice and the concept of morality, the concept of good, it's all been over the map historically. There have been times in our Canadian history where things were done even in the name of God that were not good. In our standard, in our imaginings today, we would think if we lived back then, there's no way we would have believed or agreed to that idea as being a good idea. I'll give you another weird example, is Adam and Eve. How many people have ever thought, man, if I wouldn't have eaten that stupid apple? That's because you know now, and you wouldn't have done it. Yeah, we would have been, you wouldn't, I don't care if it was Adam and Veronica. Sorry, Veronica. Or if it was Andy. <laughs> Sorry, Andy. <laughs> and Eve. It doesn't matter who was back there. We all would have screwed it up. Ah, how many people curses to those great, 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 great grandparents of ours that they chose to disobey God and not do what he asked them to do. And now we live with the consequences of sin. But let me even get a little bit more clearer than that. On the screen, you see a bunch of different women, and let's just use that issue for an example. Based on the current ethic of how women should be treated in this modern world, I mean the whole idea that men and women are equal is accepted by society today, without a doubt. Men and women are equal, it means, duh, we, you know, we're raised in a generation where we recognize that all people are created equal, and women are, are people. It used to be chattel. That used to be the idea that women weren't even real people. They weren't persons. They were owned by men. So let's go back a few generations. Let's go back a couple centuries and think, you know, how many people back then would have went to heaven if that was their belief? So we look at that, that was not good. There'd be like maybe a dozen men would make it to heaven. That would be, all the women are going, yeah, that's right, amen. Pre preach on, Pastor. I'm not done yet, ladies. Hang on to your seat. So hang on to your seats. So we value the dignity of women, and that's good. But anybody prior to the 20th century, maybe, maybe a dozen or so guys would have made it to heaven based on our standard of good. Think about that. The idea of how women were treated for centuries, even in the day of Jesus, he was such a revolutionary he honored women. He spoke with women, even from different nationalities and ethnicities. And he honored them and gave them the time of the day. How many people know Jesus was the great revolutionary when it came to lifting up women to who they really are, created in the image of God? Jesus loved women. Some of his disciples were women. It's amazing what he did. 
In some parts of the world today, and it doesn't go very long, you watch the TV, if you see what's happening with the Taliban, it's still an assumption that men are better than women. So even today, that is an area where there is a discrepancy between what is good and what is not good. It's self-evident to us, would you agree? I think it's hugely a bad idea to ever put anyone lesser than you. And that's not just having humility and honoring everybody. That's the way it is. That's how God created us. So if you live your whole life thinking this, that's absurd. If you think that today, knowing what we know today. Women, if you're thinking, I love this message. Yeah, but let me just also say my point is simply this. That good is a moving target. If a moving target culturally, it's a moving target generationally, it's a moving target nationally. We're not in Afghanistan today. Hello. It's a moving target, if you're really honest, even personally. It, you know, things that used to bother you or that bother you now didn't bother you before. But now certain things bother you because you see that that wasn't good to believe that way. How many people have ever changed in your own ideas of what is good before? Absolutely. I hope you have. It's constantly changing. There's no consensus. So how can we judge who goes to heaven if they're good enough or not based on that? In this generation, just think of the next generation, what their standards of good will be. It probably will be fluid and changing all the time. Now, of course, people say to you, wait, 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 you're the pastor. Preach a Bible verse that tells us how to get to heaven. Hang on, hang on. You guys are waiting for that. That's great. I'm talking to everybody all together, and we're on a journey. And if you don't get everything you need this Sunday, guess what? There's two more Sundays that you can hang out with us, and we'll definitely unpack this whole idea. I don't have time to do everything today. Now, if you're the pastor, pastor, tell us what the Bible says. What's the standard? Tell us what's right from wrong, good and bad. Tell us by the standard by which God should measure our behavior. The Bible tells us enough about good, but it doesn't tell us what is good enough. Now hear me out. Please brace yourself. Listen to the rest of this message. Don't tune out. Don't turn offline right now when I make this statement. I don't, here's the statement that you're going to be shocked with, guaranteed, but please let me finish this sermon before you throw stones or, or hymnals or whatever it is in your hand. Okay. I don't advise you to use the Bible because if the Bible itself is the standard, none of us are going to make it to heaven. Oh, see what I mean? How many of you are a little nervous about this idea? The Bible is full of stuff of heaven. No doubt about it. Jesus talked about heaven so often. The kingdom of heaven is this. And he described this incredible opportunity for those who follow God can experience the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. The New Testament itself has more references to the afterlife in heaven than any ancient literature whatsoever. By far, the New Testament is packed full of scriptures about heaven. There's so much about eternity, so much about heaven. If we're going to find a way to work our way to heaven, you think the Bible would actually give us a blueprint or stepping stones or three plan, three step plan to get, how many people know there are no lists in the Bible? They're like, do this, do this, do this. Congratulations, you're going to heaven. Some people say, well, if you say the sinner's prayer and if you're nice to your pastor and if you go to church once in a while, that's guaranteed you're going to heaven. All right, take, go ahead and like gamble with that one. Really? Okay, where are you going, pastor? This is the weirdest message you've ever preached. Absolutely, it is. The Bible's full of heaven. But if you're going to look at the, what is required to be good, we're all out of luck. We got no dice to roll because none of us measure up. When Paul understands, no, Paul he was the goodest, okay? Bad English, but you know what I mean. He was the goodest of the goods. He was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. He kept the law as best as a religious person could. He was of all the goodest pe people. And then he became a follower of Jesus and realized good is not good enough. 
Religion won't save you. Religion is not enough to get you into heaven. So when Paul, hear this, this is the answer here. When Paul understands the message of Jesus, woo, thank you, Jesus. How many people are glad you met Jesus and understand the message of Jesus? And when he kind of gets the fuller picture of eternity, here's what he wrote in Romans. There's no one good enough. There's no one righteous. No, not even one. Paul said, there's nobody that's good. Like, that's what he said. The Bible says it now. If you're not sure what I'm talking about, let me take you to Romans 3, verse 20. We'll throw that on the screen right now. Therefore, no one, let's read that with me. Therefore, no one will be declared righteous in God's sight by being good by the works of the law. Okay, there's your Bible verse. So good is not enough. So if you find the law in the Bible, you find some rules that you're supposed to keep anywhere, and you think, if I just keep these laws, keep these rules, at least I won't go to jail, I won't get a you know, ticket from the cops, I won't, you know, all these kind of natural laws. And also, if I keep the Bible laws, then probably if I'm consistent, I'm going to be declared righteous and good enough by God at the very end. And Paul says, you're kidding yourself. Why? Verse 30, 23 of the same chapter, this is what Paul says. And this famous statement, you all know this, you've heard this before, and you heard it growing up, you've ever been around church, you've definitely heard it if somebody walked you through the Romans' road to salvation. Anybody remember what that was? These scriptures in Romans that led you to verse 23, and it says this, all have sinned, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory or the presence of God. We've all, oh my gosh, like, really? None of us are good enough? The Bible does not provide us with that standard of good conduct because good conduct is not what God is asking from us. We do good. We, Jesus, in fact, the opposite, when he, when he talked about goodness, he wanted us to be good even to those who despitefully used us. Pray for those who hate you. Jesus, like, turned the whole good thing upside down. Don't just be good to people who are good to you, but you have to love your enemies, how many people know that's really hard? Anybody ever had that challenge before? To be good to people who you can't stand? Even thinking that is not good, right? So the Bible does not give us a magic ta-da list. You're going to heaven. And it doesn't give us what we really crave is a to-do list. I'm at that stage of my life. My wife texts me my to-do list. Because I'm walking in food basics and I'm going, I'm here for something. I'm going to walk around till I remember what it is. Yogurt. How many people you're at that stage, you need a to-do list wherever you go. I got one thing to pick up at the hardware store and I walk out with three things. You know, like, I think it's one of them. The idea is that there are no to-do lists in heaven because that's what we really need and that's what we really want. But that's not what's going to get us to heaven. And if you think otherwise, then you haven't read your Bible correctly. So that's an unsettling reality. Would you agree with me? We have no established standard. Now, there's more unsettling realities, obviously. We're going to walk through a couple of them here. The second myth, here we are, with the good people go to heaven, is we don't know what percentage of our actions must be good to make the cut. Oh, that's interesting. Is it like a test? It's like if I get score 70% good of my life, 30%, oh, we don't talk about it, but 70%, I'm pretty good. Do I make the cut? That percentage gets me into heaven. What if it's 50? And you go, Whoosh. some of you are going, yeah, thank God, that's 50%. I'll take the 50. You know, like is 50% good enough? 51. Okay, 51% good enough. The point is we have no idea because there isn't a standard like this in the scriptures, the percentage of our deeds that require us that we need to do to make the cut to get to heaven. Nobody told us that. Jesus didn't tell us that. Does God factor our environment where we grew up in? I don't know if that's a good thing or not, because I grew up in an environment where I had to go to church. You've heard my pricky pants stories. 
I was gonna bring my little pricky pants shorts to prove that even in the summertime, I wore pricky pants. I, little, I, say, I don't know what I did. My wife goes, get rid of those stupid little boy shorts. They're a memory to me of what I endured, the, the, the struggles of my childhood, where I wore pricky pants to church. I was gonna bring them here and throw them in the crowd, tell you, woo, all right, but I, I couldn't find them. I don't know, I, saving them for how many years, and then the Sunday I need them, I couldn't find my pricky pants. Honey, did you do something with those pricky pants? Yeah. <laughs> she probably said, all right, you threw up my hillbilly clothes, probably need to throw my... No, she didn't do that. But the reality is, and by the way, I believed in hell because our church didn't have air conditioning and it was hotter than hell every Sunday in pricky pants in the summertime. Hi, mom. Glad you're watching. And this one's a little scary. You know, does God take environment into account? At uh, what age do our deeds start counting? You know, what's the, the age of accountability? You know, do, when does that start to count? I hope somewhere it's past 40, right? You know, like, you know, you guys don't like hope that wasn't counted. Or where, maybe some of you go, hope it was 60, 70. When does that start? When do we realize, come on, if heaven depends on this, shouldn't the formula be very clear? A little bit clearer system in the Bible it doesn't say. Here's myth number three is do our thoughts or motives or intentions count for anything? Well, you've heard the saying, the road, to, you know, not to heaven, but the road paved with what good intentions? Like, I don't know, is that true? I have no idea, but maybe my good intentions, God likes my good intentions. A pastor, you're absurd. That's just, you know, what are you talking about here? People have no idea what the rules are. Well, what about this? What if I miss number five? What if I miss heaven by one good deed? Oh, but I just did one more. It would have balanced the scale. Like it's some scale. Bad, 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 and good. Oh, do good. I'd be nice to my pastor and buy him a blueberry cake or something. I don't know. Or like whatever. No, I don't want blueberry cake. I'm not asking. But just whatever you think is that good deed that just tips the scales in your favor. Come on, we don't really say those things out loud. We kind of think, I need to be a little better. I'm going to do a little better job here. If they're tipping your, oh, then you think, oh, there was just that one infraction that bumped you off the good scale, and now you can't spend eternity in heaven. It, you know, when you lost your temper with that customer service rep on the phone, come on, that was that one, that was it. Oh, wouldn't that be unfair? That's unjust. That's not how it works. That's not how good works. Let me give you myth number six here. I want you to think about this. If good people go to heaven, we'll leave this right here. If good people go to heaven, if there's some cosmic scale, if that's really how it works, but God never took the time to explain it, never gave us the reasons and the lists, how it really works, but God never took that time to even individually visit with us and tell us exactly what is good enough, how it works if it's a percentage or motives count, if all of this is a mystery and eternity depends on it, then God is not good. That's a myth, because he is. But if we, you see what I mean? When you scratch beyond the surface of the good people go to heaven idea, then everything starts following apart. I mean, listen to this, for example. What do you call a teacher? You know, you have a teacher. So somebody that's teaching you a lesson, what do you call a teacher who doesn't give you any notes, doesn't really pay attention in class to you, doesn't explain anything, but gives you an exam, gives you a final exam on a date you know nothing about, you just show up and you know nothing about the course, and then they give you a final exam. Would you call that a good teacher? It's not a trick question. No. What, what do you call a boss? A boss is going to give you a performance review that never gave you a job description, never had a meeting with you, never explained expectations to you, didn't actually tell you what your job was, and then fires you because you didn't meet your expectations. Would you call that a, your boss? Hope not. But would you call that a good boss? Absolutely not. That's not good. That's not fair. That's not just. But what if we looked at God? He has a very different view of goodness and justice and fairness. And what if he review, refused to f reveal that 
still not a good God. That's what some believe. He's still not a good God. Some people believe it's up to God. Some theology believes that there's only a few people that are picked. Few are chosen, the rest, uh, you, you know, what the H. It doesn't matter. And just five people of this people group and six people, there's some people believe that only 144,000 people will ever make it to heaven. That's a weird cultic lie. There are more than 144. It's going multitudes of multitudes of people will make it to heaven. So don't believe the lie. If somebody comes and knocks on your door and has a little badge on and says, hey, 144,000 people are going to heaven. Would you like to be one of them? Don't believe the lie because there are no rules and lists like that in God's word or in God's heart. Because if God is good and I can't testify that he really is, let me tell you what we need to understand. Because I love you and you're here visiting for the very first time, you, you, you hear those words from a guy on a platform that maybe you've been in a church before and you've, you've been ridiculed or mocked for your belief systems or your standards of living or whatever, and you think, I'm not accepted. How could, a, how could a pastor say I'm loved? Let me tell you by the word of God, my call is not just because it's my job to love you. I truly have the love of God in my heart today. And I tell you that God is good. And the Bible is not the good enough manual. But the Bible does say some things about how we get to heaven. I've probably done hundreds of funerals. Kyle's done a whole bunch. I know lately, Pastor Kyle's awesome at funerals. You know, he's just really got this sense about a funeral. He knows how to care. Pastor Marilyn, where's Pastor Marilyn? Where is she today? Like Pastor Marilyn, man, I've been to one of her funerals just a while back, just visiting in the back and just listening. And, oh my goodness. She knows how to bring people's heart to God. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a gift when you arrive at a funeral and you have a minister that actually knows who God is and gives the gospel to people. You ever been to a funeral where nobody knew what in the heck was going on? Well, we hope he was good enough. You know, here's Joe and, you know, I guess he's good enough for us. I hope he was good enough for heaven. You ever been to a funeral like that? That is the saddest place. Because there's no hope in that. I hope he was good enough for heaven. Let's pray to God and let us, all the spinning and wondering where Joe is right now. In your name, oh Lord, we pray. Amen. That's bunk. It's crazy time. I pray that when we show up at a funeral, we show up at your funeral, Maybe it's not me, maybe it's somebody else who's the efficient, that they actually tell you about the realities of your life. And they say this, this person wasn't good enough to go to heaven, but they knew who was good. And because of the relationship to the one who is always good, they made it to heaven. Wow. So what do we tell our children if you don't believe in God and if you don't believe that there's an afterlife in heaven? I'm going to tell you, this is a, re this is a true. I'm going to read from this little article here. Psychoanalyst and author Erica Commissar, that's her real name. She, she put it in a publication, so me, me naming her name is not a bad thing, although what she's saying is absolutely insane. She's an atheist, and she writes in this article, I'm often asked by parents, how do I talk to my child about death if I don't believe in God or heaven? Which she doesn't. And this is what she says, and my answer is always the same. She says, lie, lie, lie. Why? Why lie, she says? Because the idea that you simply die and turn to dust may work for some adults, but listen to me, not many adults, by the way. It may work for some adults, but it doesn't help children. Ready for this? This is what she says. Belief in heaven helps them grapple with a tremendous and incomprehensible loss. So lie to them. How many think that's crazy? Only thank you, Aileen. Appreciate that. I think that's crazy. That's more bunk. So what do we do? What do we say? So don't miss part two next week when I tell you the answer. So I loved, I wanted to end this message with a cliffhanger right here. You ever watch a show with a cliffhanger? And you go, oh, 
oh, we got to watch the next episode. You're streaming, and you think, oh, that's the last one. And then they leave you at a cliffhanger, and you've got to watch the next one. And it'd be guilty of a Netflix thing or a... Pr yeah. I was hoping to do that today, but there's no guarantee that you're going to be here next week. <laughs> so I asked Jesus about it. Honestly, I said, Lord, you know, should I leave it right now? And he said, no. Tell them what I think about heaven. How many people do Jesus think Jesus has got a good idea here? So according to Jesus, I'm not done. Some of you wanted to be done so you can go to your hamburger or whatever you're going next, but I've got to finish this in the message now because Jesus won't let me. All right, five more minutes. We're good. Can we have four? <laughs> three and a half. Thanks for the three and a half. So when I asked Jesus, he said, no, tell them what I said. So according to Jesus, good people don't go to heaven. According to Jesus, it's the very opposite of what most people who believe that there's a heaven think. Jesus didn't believe that good people go to heaven by what he taught and what he said about heaven. So he clearly believed in goodness. Here's the gotcha. Here's the strange thing. Here's the sit-up moment in this sermon to pay attention in this closing moment like you've never paid attention in these last 30 minutes. Jesus did not teach that good people to go to heaven, but he instructed his followers to be good, to do good, to even to their enemies. So how do we do that unless we have the God who is good living within us to be able to do? Here's how, I, how good I want to be. This is what God, this is what Jesus is saying. I want you to be as good as my father is in heaven. What? So nothing Jesus taught, nothing illustrated, no parable, nothing points to the fact that there was a list. He, he took good to another level. To the goodest of goods, the Pharisees, they hated Jesus. The teachers of the law hated Jesus when he talked about this to love your enemies, to be good to those who despitefully use you. And they could not even keep their own laws because of what Jesus was saying. And yet never once did Jesus infer that it had to be good enough to spend eternity in heaven. So good is not the measurement. The good news of Jesus Christ is the means. Amen. Now, most of you know this story. At the end of Jesus' life, the good people of the day conspired with the bad people of the day to kill Jesus on a cross. And we know the story where they kill, crucify him, they conspire to kill him, and, but he had the final word because from the cross, and it's so amazing what he said from the cross to every single person in this room today, he said to a very bad man, a thief and a robber, I, I will see you on the other side today. You will join me in heaven today. If Jesus first followers, first century followers claimed that he is really the good news, which I believe and many of you do believe, you don't have to lie to your children about heaven and eternity. Jesus promised there would be one. In fact, he said, I go to my father who is in heaven in John chapter 14. So when I'm at funerals, when I'm surrounded by Jesus followers, they grieve with hope because they know in their nowhere that there is a great eternity awaiting in heaven. And I've done some graveside funerals, even in the last year, where it was all grief, no hope, because no one believed truly that that person had a relationship with Jesus. And that's sad. So if Jesus was correct, here's the scripture, God so loved the world that he showed up for us. How do you get to heaven? Jesus showed up. He says, hey, follow me. I know the way. Oh, he said more than that. He said, follow me. I am the way. For God so loved the world that he gave, the rest of the verse, his one and only son. God gave himself. How many people know John 3.16? There's no list there. That if you believe in him, Whoever puts their trust in him, really? Next part, whoever puts their trust in him, who believes in him, that person will not be lost to God, regardless of what they've done or didn't do. Wow. 
Oh, isn't that good news? That is so good news. So we don't have to be good enough, but we get to be good and do good because Jesus himself takes us to heaven when we put our trust and believe in him. Sonia and I were in a hospital one time. We prayed with this man who was dying at the end of his days and we led him in the prayer to put his trust in Jesus and believe in Jesus. And that's all it took was a belief in his heart. He never went to church. He never gave in the offering. He never did a good deed. He just went to heaven because he put his trust in Jesus. Here's the last scripture in John 3, 17. It ends 3, 16, and then there's 3, 17. Three and a half years later, John the apostle writes this. Three and a half years with Jesus. And at the end of life, John writes this. For God did not send Jesus into the world to catch people doing wrong and to condemn people for doing wrong or to condemn, condemn the world. What did he come to do? to save the world through him. I want to pray for you this morning. If you don't know him, I don't care how good or not good you are. If you don't know him, and John tells us this, here's how it is. This is why Jesus came. He saw Jesus live with Jesus. He knew Jesus never gave him a to-do list. He, Jesus didn't use good as the equation to get to heaven. Next week, we'll talk a little bit more about heaven about some other things that's interesting. But there's no more lying to our kids. There's no more lying to ourselves. You can know Jesus and believe and put your trust in him. Let's pray together. Would you bow your heads with me if you can? You don't have to close your eyes. You don't have to bow your heads. But I'm just asking you in this, in this little moment that we, we have right now, if you could consider this idea that you stop putting a heavy burden on your mind and your heart about being good enough. And you say, Jesus, I place my trust in you. You came. God loved me so much that he sent you to be my way. And if I put my trust in you and I believe in you, I don't have to lie to myself anymore. I can know that heaven awaits me. So, Lord, I pray for anybody here who's been staring at the ceiling of their life, worried if they're good enough, if things between them and God are good. I pray, Lord, in this moment that heavy burden lifts and that you take them out of that fear and that worry and you give them courage in this moment to say, Jesus, I trust you. I believe in you. And in your name we pray, O oh Lord. Amen. Worship team's going to close us in a song here, but I'm going to say this one more time. I love you. And if you heard that message today, you're going to go to heaven if you believe it to be true. I just want us to close in prayer as we leave from this place. Pastor Kyle and Amy are going to head to the lobby area to greet with you and to connect with you. If you have any more questions you want to ask, Pastor Kyle and Amy will be there. Um, Sonia and I will be up front. If you want to come and say hello, if you're visiting with us today, we'd love to say hello and just meet you and greet you. Uh, take your name into our heart and think of you, but also just to say hi and thank you for coming today. And also, if anybody wants prayer, we'd love to pray for you as well. If you have a personal prayer need, uh, know that this church will pray for you and care, care deeply about that. So we, we'd love to pray for you. So let's pray together. Um, if your spouse is with you or loved ones with you, you want to join hands with them, family member, as we just pray for families. And by the way, if you're a parent here, uh, good luck on trying to get your kids out of the gym. So I just think you're, we'll pray for you as well because that might be a tug of war. <laughs> All right, wonderful. Lord, today we are so grateful to be in your house to hear the word of the Lord, to have opportunity to sing songs of our faith and declaration of what we believe in honoring your name. I pray, Lord, for anybody going through difficulties in this time, that your Holy Spirit would be there to comfort them, lead them, guide them. May, may your healing come in all the different forms that you desire to show in, up in their life. And I pray that you watch over every one of these families represented by those who are gathered here today, their loved ones who may not be here and others, but Father, we just pray that your blessing would be upon all of their lives and that you would strengthen them and show them the way, show them hope. His name is Jesus. And may we go forth with great joy in your glorious name. Amen.
God bless you. See you next week. We'll be up front saying hello. Pastor Kyle's already gone. Have a great week serving him.